Chapter 5, Part 3. Start at 5.8. Perception is guided by cues in the environment. When we look at an array of objects in a photograph of that array, both scenes create exact same image on the retina. Despite this inherent ambiguity, we do not confuse the real three-dimensional scene with the two-dimensional picture of it. Why not? Consider, too, that when an object moves past us, it may look completely different from the back than from the front, and its image grows, image grows smaller as the object moves away. Yet we still know it is the same object. How do we, how do, we do that? Such information, uh, such forms of perception result from environmental cues. Depth perception. We are able to perceive depth in the two-dimensional patterns of photographs, movies, videos, and television images because the brain applies the same rules or mechanisms that it uses to work out the spatial relations between objects in the three-dimensional world. To do this, the brain draws on its existing knowledge about the appearance of the world. That is, the brain rapidly and automatically exploits certain prior assumptions it has about the relationship between two-dimensional image cues and the three-dimensional world. Among these assumptions are cues that help the visual system perceive depth. These depth cues can be divided into two types. Binocular depth cues are available from both eyes together and contribute to bottom-up processing. Monocular depth cues are available from each eye alone and provide organizational information for top-down processing. One of the most important cues in to depth perception is binocular disparity, or retinal disparity. This cue is caused by the distance between humans' two eyes. Because each eye has a slightly different view of the world, the brain has access to two different but overlapping retinal images. The brain uses the disparity between these two retinal images to compute distances to nearby objects. The ability to determine an object's depth based on that object's projections to each eye is called stereoscopic vision. A related binocular depth cue is convergence. This term refers to the way the eye muscles turn the eyes inward when we view nearby objects. The brain knows how much the eyes are converging and uses this information to perceive distance, figure 5.28. Although binocular disparity is an important cue for depth perception, it is useful only for relatively close objects. Furthermore, we can perceive depth even with one eye closed because of monocular depth cues. Artists routinely use these cues to create a sense of depth, so monocular depth cues are also called pictorial depth cues. The Renaissance painter, sculptor, architect, and engineer Leonardo da Vinci first identified many of these cues, which include occlusion, a near object occludes or blocks an object that is farther away, relative size, where far-off objects project a smaller retinal image than close objects do if the far-off and close objects are the same physical size, familiar size, because we know how large familiar objects are, we can tell how far away they are by the size of their retinal images, linear perspective, seemingly parallel lines appear to converge in the distance, texture gradient, as a uniformly textured surface recedes, its texture continuously becomes denser. And position relative to horizon. All else being equal, objects below the horizon that appear higher in the visual field are perceived as being farther away. Objects above the horizon that appear lower in the visual field are perceived as being farther away. Figure 5.29. Size perception. For size, the distance matters. The size of an object's retinal image depends on that object's distance from the observer. The farther away the object is, the smaller its retinal image. So to determine an object's size, the visual system needs to know how far away the object is. Most of the time, enough depth information is available for the visual system to work out an object's distance and thus infer how large the object is. Size perception sometimes fails, however, and an object may look bigger or smaller than it really is. This optical illusion arises when normal perceptual processes incorrectly represent the distance between the viewer and the stimuli. In other words, depth cues can fool us into seeing depth when it is not there. Alternatively, a lack of depth cues can fool us into not seeing depth when it is there. 
This section considers two phenomena related to both depth perception and distance perception. Ames boxes, also called Ames rooms, and the Ponzo illusion. Ames boxes were created, crafted in 1940s by Albert Ames, a painter turned scientist. These constructions present powerful depth illusions. Inside the Ames boxes, rooms play with linear perspective and other distance cues. One such room makes a far corner appear the same distance away as a near corner, figure 5.31. In a normal room, and in this Ames's box, the nearby child projects a larger retinal image than the child farther away. Normally, however, the nearby child would not appear to be a giant because the perceptual system would take depth into account when assessing size. Here, the depth cues are wrong, so the nearby child appears farther away than he is, and the disproportionate size of his image on your retina makes him look huge. The Ponzo illusion, first described by the psychologist Mario Ponzo in 1913, is another classic example of a size-distance illusion, figure 5.32. The common explanation for this effect is that monocular depth cues make the two-dimensional figure seem three-dimensional. As noted earlier, seemingly parallel lines appear to converge in the distance. Here, the two lines drawn to look like railroad tracks receding in the distance trick your brain into thinking they are parallel. Therefore, you perceive the two parallel lines in the center as if they are at different distances and thus different in size when they are actually the same size. This illusion shows how much rely, we rely on depth perception to gauge size. The brain defaults <coughs> to using depth cues even when depth is absent. Once again, the brain responds as efficiently as possible. Motion perception. <coughs> we know how motion can cue depth perception. But how does the brain perceive motion? One answer is that we have neurons specialized for detecting movement. In other words, these neurons fire when movement occurs. But how does the brain know what is moving? If you look out a window and see a car driving past a house, how does your brain know the car is moving and not the house? Sometimes we can experience the illusion of movement when none is actually present. Figure 5.33. Consider the dramatic case of M.P., a German woman after receiving damage to secondary visual areas of her brain, areas critical for motion perception. M.P. saw the world as a series of snapshots rather than as a moving image. Pouring tea, she would see the liquid frozen in air and be surprised when her cup overflowed. Before crossing a street, she might spot a car far away. When she tried to cross, however, that car would be right in front of her. MP had a unique deficit. She could perceive objects and colors, but not continuous movement. There are two additional phenomena that offer insights into how the visual system perceives motion. Motion after effects and stroboscopic motion perception. Motion after effects may occur when you gaze at a moving image for a long time and then look at a stationary scene. You experience a momentary impression that the new scene is moving in the opposite direction from the moving image. This illusion is also called the waterfall effect, because if you stare at a waterfall and then turn away, the scenery you are now looking at will seem to move upward for a moment. Motion after effects are strong evidence that motion-sensitive neurons exist in the brain. According to the theory that explains this illusion, the visual cortex has neurons that respond to movement in a given direction. When you stare at a moving stimulus long enough, these direction-specific neurons begin to adapt to the motion. That is, they become fatigued and therefore less sensitive. If the stimulus is suddenly removed, the motion detectors that respond to all the other directions are more active than the fatigued motion detectors. Thus, you will see the new scene moving in the other direction. Movies are made up of still frame images, presented one after the other to create the illusion of motion pictures. This phenomenon is based on stroboscopic movement, a perceptual illusion that occurs when two or more slightly different images are presented in rapid succession. Figure 5.34.
object constancy. Illusions occur when the brain creates inaccurate representations of stimuli. In the opposite situation, object constancy, the brain correctly perceives objects as constant despite sensory data that could lead it to think otherwise. Consider your image in the mirror. When you, what you see in the mirror might look like it is your actual size, but the image is much smaller than the part of you being reflected. If you doubt this claim, try tracing around the image of your face in a steamy bathroom mirror. Similarly, how does the brain know that a person is six feet tall when the retinal image of that person changes size according to how near or far the person is? How does the brain know that snow is white and a tire is black? Or even when snow, even when snow at night or a tire in bright light might send the same cues to the retina? For the most part, changing an object's angle, distance, or illumination does not change our perception of that object's size, shape, color, or lightness. But to perceive any of these four constancies, we need to understand the relationship between the object and at least one other factor. For size constancy, constancy, we need to know how far away the object is from us, figure 5.35. For shape constancy, we need to know what angle or angles we are seeing the object from. For color constancy, we need to compare the wavelengths of light reflected from the object with those reflected from its background. Likewise, for lightness constancy, we need to know how much light is being reflected from the object and from its background, figure 5.36. In each case, the brain computes the relative magnitude rather than relying on each sensation's absolute magnitude. The perceptual system's ability to make relative judgments allows it to maintain constancy across various perceptual contexts. Although the precise mechanisms are unknown, these constancies illustrate that perceptual systems do not just respond to sensory inputs. Perceptual systems are, in fact, tuned to detect changes from baseline conditions. By studying how illusions work, many perceptual psychologists have come to believe that the brain has built-in assumptions that influence perceptions. The vast majority of visual illusions appear to be beyond our conscious control. We cannot make ourselves not see illusions, even when we know they are not true representations of objects or events. Thus, the visual system is a complex interplay of constancies. These constancies enable us to see both a stable world and perceptual illusions that we cannot control. How are we able to hear? For humans, hearing, or audition, is second to vision as a source of information about the world. It is a mechanism for determining what is happening in an environment, and it also provides a medium for spoken language. The wonders of the auditory system are discussed by Daniel Levitin, a psychologist and former prof professional musician, in his best-selling book, This Is Your Brain on Music. Hearing music results from differences in brain activity, not from differentiated sound waves. For instance, when you hear guitars, drums, and singing, nothing in the sound waves themselves tells you which part of the music is which. Yet it is rather easy for most people to pick out the separate features in a piece of music. Through activity in different brain regions, the features all come together to create the experience of music. 5.9. Audition results from changes in air pressure. The process of hearing begins when the movements and vibrations of objects cause the displacement of air molecules. Displaced air molecules produce a change in air pressure, and that change travels through the air. The pattern of changes in air pressure during a period of time is called a sound wave. See figure 5.38. A sound wave's amplitude determines its loudness. We hear a higher amplitude as a louder sound. The wave's frequency determines its pitch. We hear a higher frequency as a sound that is, a high, that is higher in pitch. The frequency of a sound is measured in vibrations per second, called hertz abbreviated HZ. Most humans can detect sound waves of frequencies from about 20 hertz to about 20,000 hertz. Like all other sensory experiences, the sensory experience of hearing occurs within the brain, as the brain integrates the different signals provided by various sound waves. The ability to hear is based on the intricate interactions of various regions of the ear. 
when changes in air pressure produce sound waves within a person's hearing distance, those sound waves arrive in the person's outer ear and travel down the auditory canal to the eardrum. This membrane, stretched tightly across the canal, marks the beginning of the middle ear. The sound waves make the eardrum vibrate. These vibrations are transferred to ossicles, three tiny bones commonly called the hammer, anvil, and stirrup. The ossicles transfer the eardrum's vibrations to the oval window. The oval window is actually a membrane located within the cochlea in the inner ear. In the inner ear. The cochlea is a fluid-filled tube that curls into a snail-like shape with a membrane at the end called the round window. Running through the center of the cochlea is the thin basilar membrane. The oval window's vibrations create pressure waves in the cochlear fluid. These waves prompt the basilar membrane to oscillate. Movement in the basilar membrane stimulates hair cells to bend and to send information to the auditory nerve. These hair cells are the primary auditory receptors. Thus, sound waves, which are mechanical signals, hit the eardrum and are converted to neural signals that travel to the brain along the auditory nerve. This conversion of sound waves to brain activity produces the sensation of sound. Figure 5.39. Auditory neurons in the thalamus extend their axons to the primary auditory cortex which is located in the temporal lobe. Sound Localization Locating the origin of a sound is an important part of auditory perception, but the sensory receptors cannot code where events occur. Instead, the brain integrates the different sensory information coming from each ear. Much of our understanding of auditory localization has come from research with barn owls. These nocturnal birds have finely tuned hearing, which helps them locate their prey. In fact, in a dark laboratory, a barn owl can locate a mouse through hearing alone. The owl uses two cues to locate a sound, the time the sound arrives in each ear and the sound's intensity in each ear. Unless the sound comes from exactly in front or in back of the owl, the sound will reach one ear first. Whichever side it comes from, the sound will be softer on the other side because the owl's head acts as a barrier. These differences in timing and magnitude are minute, but they are not too small for the owl's brain to detect and act on, although a human's ears are not as finely tuned to locations of sounds as an owl's ears. The human brain uses information from the two ears similarly. Figure 5.40. Vestibular system. Another sensory system that relies on the ears to help us to maintain another sensory system that relies on the ears helps us to maintain balance. The vestibular sense uses information from receptors in the semicircular canals of the inner ear. These canals contain a liquid that moves when the head moves, bending hair cells at the ends of the canals. The bending generates nerve impulses that inform us of a head's rotation. In this way, the vestibular sense is responsible for our sense of balance. It explains why inner ear infections or standing up quickly can make us dizzy. The experience of being seasick or car sick results in part from conflicting signals arriving from the visual system and the vestibular system. Cochlear implants. A cochlear implant is a small electronic device that can help provide the sense of sound to a person who has a severe hearing impairment. The implant was the first neural implant used successfully in humans. Over 300,000 of these devices have been implanted worldwide since 1984, when the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved them for adults. In 1990, the FDA approved them for two-year-olds. It has since approved them for one-year-olds. Over 38,000 children in the United States have cochlear implants. The cochlear implant has helped people with severe hearing problems due to the loss of hair cells in the inner ear. Unlike a hearing aid, the implant does not amplify sound. Rather, it directly stimulates the auditory nerve. The downside is that after the implant is put in place, the person who received it loses all residual normal hearing in that ear because sound no longer travels along the inner ear, along the ear canal and middle ear. Instead, sound is picked up by a tiny microphone behind the ear, sent through a computer processor, 
and then transmitted to the implant's electrodes inside the cochlea. If the devices are implanted at a young enough age in a congen con congenitally deaf child, younger than two years being optimal, the child's hearing will be quite functional. He or she will learn to speak reasonably normal, figure 5.41. The benefits of cochlear implants might seem indisputable to many people with normal hearing. In the 1990s, however, deaf people who did not consider deafness a disability voiced concerns that the implants might adversely affect deaf culture. In fact, some deaf people believe that cochlear implants are a weapon being wielded by the medical community to wipe out deaf culture. They see this effort as being an extreme result of prejudice and discrimination against them commonly known as autism. They argue that cochlear implants disrupt the deaf community's cohesiveness. While deaf people with cochlear implants can still use sign language, apparently they are not always welcome in the signing community. This attitude has slowly been changing, but is still held by many deaf signers. 5.10. Pitch is encoded by frequency and location. How does the firing of auditory receptors signals Different, sorry, how does the firing of auditory receptors signal different frequencies of sound, such as high notes and low notes? In other words, how is pitch coded by the auditory system? Two mechanisms for encoding the frequency of an auditory stimulus operate in parallel in the basilar membrane temporal coding and place coding. Temporal coding is used to encode relatively low frequencies, such as the sound of a tuba. The firing rates of cochlear hair cells match the frequency of the pressure wave so that a 1,000 hertz tone causes hair cells to fire 1,000 times per second. Think of the boom, boom, boom of a bass drum. Physiological research has shown that this strict matching between the frequency of auditory stimulation and firing rate of the hair cells can occur only for relatively low frequencies, up to about 4,000 hertz. At higher frequencies, temporal coding can be maintained only if the hair cells fire in volleys, in which different groups of cells take turns firing so that the overall temporal pattern matches the sound frequency. Think of one group of soldiers firing their weapons together while another group, group reloads. Then that second group fires while another group reloads. Then the third group fires and so on. The second mechanism for encoding frequency is place coding. During the 19th century, the physiologist Hermann von Helmholtz proposed that different receptors in the basilar membrane respond to different frequencies. According to this idea, low frequencies would activate a different type of receptor than high frequencies would. Later, the perceptual psychologist George von Beckesee discovered that Helmholtz's idea was theoretically correct, but wrong in the details. Bekesi discovered that different frequencies activate receptors at different locations on the basilar membrane. The receptors are similar, but located in different places. The basilar membrane responds to sound waves like a clarinet reed, vibrating in resonance with the sound. Because the membrane's stiffness decreases along its length, higher frequencies vibrate better at its base, while lower frequencies vibrate more toward its tip. Thus, Hair cells at the base of the cochlea are activated by high-frequency sounds. Hair cells at the tip are activated by low-frequency sounds. The frequency of, sound wave, of a sound wave, therefore, is encoded by the receptors on the area of the basilar membrane that vibrates the most, figure 5.42. Both temporal coding and place coding are involved in the perception of pitch. Most of the sounds we hear from conversations to concerts, are made up of many frequencies and activate a broad range of hair cells. Our perception of sound relies on the integrated activities of many neurons. Using psychology in your life, 5.11. Are you listening? Are your listening habits damaging your hearing? Portable listening devices let us take our music wherever we go. State-of-the-art headphones and earbuds make the listening experience like being in the recording studio with our favorite artists. But blasting music through headphones and earbuds is known to cause hearing loss. According to the National Institutes of Health, noise-induced hearing loss is caused by exposure to sounds that are too loud or loud sounds that last a long time. 
Exposure to music typically occurs over long periods of time and thus falls in the second category of risks. Loud noises in headphones or earbuds in the car, in a room, at a concert can permanently damage the sensitive hair cells in the inner ear that transmit signals to brain areas involved in sound perception. Once those hair cells are damaged, they cannot be repaired. Eventually, they die. If we do not protect those fragile structures, we will not be able to rely on them to hear music, lectures, the television, or any sounds at all. Researchers based in New York City studied the noise exposure of college students who used personal listening devices such as iPods. As students emerged from the subway adjacent to the urban campus, the researchers invited them to complete a short questionnaire to assess their music listening habits and asked if they would put their headphones or earbuds on a special mannequin. This mannequin was equipped with a sound level meter that measured the intensity of the noise coming from the headset. On average, the music was playing at 92.6 decibels, about the intensity of a power mower or a motorcycle roaring by. The research participants reported using the listening devices on average of 18.4 hours per week. The average intensity and duration of noise exposure certainly puts these students at risk for noise-induced hearing loss. To hear examples of other noises that can put your hearing at risk, check out the National Institute of Health's Sound Ruler. But how can we know if the energy waves are pumping through our headphones need to be taken down a notch or two? The American Speech Hearing Language Association says that noise levels are dangerous if you must raise your voice to be heard. If you can't hear someone three feet away from you, speech around you sounds muffled or dull after you leave the noisy area, or you have a pain or ringing in your ears, this is called tinnitus, after exposure to noise. According to the National Institutes of Health, if you wear headphones, the volume is too loud if a person standing near you can hear the music coming through the headphones. Music is a part of who we are, but for those of us who have not already suffered hearing loss, so is our hearing. Enjoying music while protecting our hearing will help keep music part of us for the long haul. How are we able to taste? Food provides us with the calories and nutrients necessary for survival. However, since we are not all dietitians, how do we know what to eat? The job of gestation, our sense of taste, is to keep poisons out of our digestive system while allowing safe food in. The stimuli for taste are chemical substances from food that dissolve in saliva, but the operations of these stimuli are still largely a mystery, and no simple explanation of taste could do justice to the importance of taste in our daily experience. Animals love tasty food, some flavors more than others. Humans in many cultures spend a substantial amount of time planning their meals to bring enjoyment. Beyond the basic chemistry of the sense and its importance for survival, how is the perception of taste determined? 5.12 There are five basic taste sensations. The taste receptors are part of taste buds. These sensory organs are mostly on the tongue, in the tiny mushroom-shaped structures called papillae but are also spread throughout the mouth and throat. Most individuals have approximately 8,000 to 10,000 taste buds. When food, fluid, or other some other substances, like dirt, stimulates a taste bud, they send signals to the thalamus. These signals are then routed in the, to the frontal lobe, which produces the experience of taste, figure 5.44. In all the senses, a near infinite variety of perceptual experiences arises from the activation of unique combinations of receptors. Scientists once believed that different regions of the tongue were more sensitive to certain tastes, but they now know that the different taste buds are spread relatively uniformly throughout the tongue and mouth. Every taste experience is composed of a mixture of five basic qualities, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. Japanese for savory or yummy. Only within the last decade have scientists recognized umami as the fifth taste sensation. This delicious taste was perhaps first call, created in, intentionally in the late 1800s when the French chef Auguste Escoffier invented a veal stock that did not taste primarily sweet, sour, salty, or bitter. Independently of Escoffier in 1908, the Japanese cook and chemist uh, Kikune Ikeda 
identified the taste as arising from the detection of glutamate, a substance that occurs naturally in foods such as meat, some cheese, and mushrooms. Glutamate is a sodium salt in glutamic acid. As monosodium glutamate, or MSG, this salt can be added to various foods as a flavor enhancer. Soy sauce is full of the umami flavor. Taste alone does not affect how much you like a certain type of food. As you might know from having had colds, food seems tasteless if your nasal passages are blocked. That is because taste relies heavily on the sense of smell. A food's texture also matters. Whether a food is soft or crunchy, creamy or granular, tender or tough, affects the sensory experience. That experience is also affected if the food causes discomfort, as can happen with spicy chilies. The entire taste experience occurs not in your mouth, but in your brain, which integrates these various sensory signals. Super tasters. Some people experience especially intense taste sensations, a trait largely determined by genetics. Linda Bartoshuk, the researcher who first studied these individuals, whom she called super tasters, found that they have more taste buds than normal tasters. Recent evidence, however, suggests that underlying genetics rather than the number of taste buds, is the major determinant of whether a person is a super taster. First identified by their extreme dislike of bitter substances, such as grapefruit, broccoli, and coffee, super tasters are highly aware of flavors and textures and are more likely than others to feel pain when eating very spicy foods. They tend to be thin. Women are more likely than men to be super tasters. Taster status is also a function of age, because people lose half their taste receptors by age 20. Although it might sound enjoyable to experience intense taste, many super tasters and young children are especially picky eaters because particular tastes can overwhelm them. When it comes to sensation, more is not necessarily better. Cultural influences. Everyone has individual taste preferences. For example, some people hate uh, anchovies, while others love them. Some people love sour foods, foods, while others prefer sweet ones. These preferences come partly from differences in the number of taste receptors. The same food can actually taste different to different people because the sensation associated with that food differs in different people's mouths. But the cultural factors influence taste preferences as well. Some cultures like red hot peppers, others like salty fish, others rich sauces, and so on. Cultural influences on food preferences began in the womb. In a study of infant food preferences, pregnant women were assigned to four groups. Some drank carrot juice every day during the last two months of pregnancy, then drank carrot juice again every day during the first two months after the childbirth. Some drank a comparable amount of water every day during both those periods. Some drank uh, carrot juice during the first period, then drank water during the second period. Some drank water in the first period, then drank carrot juice during the second period. All the mothers breastfed their babies, so the taste of what each mother ate was in the breast milk that constituted each newborn's sole food source during the first few months of life. When the babies were several months old, they were all fed carrot juice, either alone or mixed with a cereal. The infants whose mothers drank carrot juice during the two months before childbirth, the first two months after childbirth, or both periods showed a preference for carrot juice compared with the infants whose mothers drank only water during those same months. Thus, through their own eating behaviors before and immediately following birth, mothers apparently pass their eating preferences on to their offspring. Once again, as noted throughout this book, nature and nurture are inextricably entwined. How are we able to smell? The human sense of smell is vastly inferior to that of many animals. For example, dogs inferior. <laughs> For example, dogs have 40 times more olfactory receptors than the humans do and are 100,000 to 1 million times more sensitive to odors. Our less developed sense of smell comes from our ancestors' reliance on vision. Yet smell's importance in our daily lives is made clear, at least in western cultures by the vast sums of money spent on fragrances, deodorants, and mouthwash. 5.13. Smell detects odorants. 
Of all the senses, smell or olfaction has the most direct route to the brain. It may, however, be the least understood sense. Like taste, it involves the sensing of chemicals that come from outside the body. We smell something when chemical particles or odorants pass into the nose and when we sniff into the nasal cavity's upper and back portions. In the nose and the nasal cavity, a warm, moist environment helps the odorant molecules come into contact with the olfactory epithelium. This thin layer of tissue is embedded with thousands of small receptors. Each receptor is responsive to different odorants. It remains unclear exactly how these receptors encode distinct smells. One possibility is that each type of receptor is uniquely associated with a specific odor. For example, one type would encode only the scent of roses. This explanation is unlikely, however, given the huge numbers of scents we can detect. Moreover, the scent of a rose actually consists of a mixture of 275 chemical components. The combination, the combination of these odorants produces a smell that we recognize as a rose. According, according to a recent estimate, humans can discriminate more than one trillion odorants. Thus, a more likely possibility regarding encoding is that each odorant stimulates several types of receptors, and the activation pattern across these receptors determines the olfactory perception. As in all sensory systems, uh, sensation and perception result from the specificity of receptors and the pattern of receptor responses. Unlike other sensory information, smell signals bypass the thalamus the early relay, substance, early relay station. Instead, the smell receptors transmit information directly to the olfactory bulb, located just below the frontal lobes. The olfactory bulb is a brain center for smell. From the olfactory bulb, smell information goes to other brain areas. Information about whether a smell is pleasant or unpleasant is processed in the brain's prefrontal cortex, and people can readily make that distinction. However, Although humans can discriminate over one trillion different odors, most people are pretty bad at identifying odors by name. Think about the smell of newly fallen rain. Even though it is familiar, it is hard to describe. If you test this claim by asking your friends or relatives to close their eyes and name a familiar food items in the fridge, they'll probably not be able to identify the smells at least half the time. Women, though, are generally better than men at identifying odors perhaps because they have more cells in the olfactory bulb than men do. The intensity of a smell is processed in brain areas that are also involved in emotion and memory. As a result, it is not surprising that olfactory stimuli can evoke feelings and memories. Figure 5.46 For example, many people find that the aromas of certain holiday foods cooking the smell of bread baking and or the fragrance of particular perfumes generate fond childhood memories. Pheromones. The sense of smell is also involved in an important mode of communication and involved in social behavior. Pheromones are chemicals released by animals, probably including humans, that trigger physiological or behavioral reactions in other animals and insects. These chemicals do not elicit smells that we are conscious of but they are processed in a manner similar to the processing of olfactory stimuli. Specialized receptors in the nasal cavity respond to the presence of pheromones. Pheromones play a major role in sexual signaling in many animal species, and they may affect humans in similar ways. How are we able to feel touch and pain? Touch, the haptic sense, conveys sensations of temperature, of pressure, and of pain. It also delivers a sense of where our limbs are in space. A system related to touch is the kinesthetic sense. Kinesthetic sensations come from receptors in muscles, in tendons, and in joints. This information enables us to pinpoint the positions in space and the movements of our bodies and our limbs. Thus, it helps us coordinate voluntary movement and is invaluable in avoiding injury. 5.14 The skin contains sensory receptors for touch and pain. Anything that makes contact with our skin provides tactile stimulation. This stimulation gives rise to the experience of touch. In fact, skin is the largest organ for sensory reception because of its large surface area. 
The haptic receptors for both temperature and pressure are sensory neurons that reach the skin's outer layer. Their long axons into the central nervous system by way of spinal or cranial nerves. Simply put, spinal nerves travel from the rest of the body into the spinal cord and then to the brain. By contrast, cranial nerves connect directly to the brain. For sensing temperature, there appear to be receptors for warmth and receptors for cold. Intense stimuli can trigger both warmth and cold receptors, however. Such stimulations, simulations, uh, simul, sorry, such simultaneous activation can produce strange sensory experiences such as a false feeling of wetness. Some receptors for pressure are nerve fibers, the bases of hair follicles that respond to movement of the hair. For other types of pressure receptors are capsules in the skin. These receptors respond to continued vibration, light fast pressure, light slow pressure, or stretching and steady pressure. The integration of various signals and higher level mental processes produces haptic experiences, figure 5.47. For instance, stroking multiple pressure points can produce a tickling sensation, which can be pleasant or unpleasant depending on the mental state of the person being tickled. By the way, Imaging research has helped answer the question of why we cannot tickle ourselves. The brain areas involved in touch sensation respond less to self-produced tactile stimulation than to external tactile stimulation. Touch information travels to the thalamus. The thalamus sends the primary somatosensory cortex in the parietal lobe. As discussed in Chapter 3, the electrical stimulation of the primary somatosensory cortex can evoke the sensation of touch in different regions of the body. See figure 3.25a. Uh, Large amount of cortical tissue are devoted to sensitive body parts, such as the fingers and the lips. Very little cortical tissue is devoted to other areas, such as the back and the calves. As a result, you can probably tell what something is if you feel it with your fingers, but you will not have equal sensitivity if the same thing touches your back. Types of pain. Pain is part of a warning system that stops you from continuing activities that may harm you. For example, the message may be to remove your hand from a jagged surface or to stop running when you have a damaged, you and you have damaged a tendon. Children born with a rare genetic disorder that leads them insensitive to pain usually die young, no matter how carefully they are supervised. They simply do not know how to avoid activities that harm them or to report when they are feeling ill. Pain receptors exist throughout the body, not just in the skin. Like other sensory experiences, the actual experience of pain is created by the brain. For instance, a person whose limb has been amputated may sometimes feel phantom pain in the non-existent limb. See figure 3.40. The person really feels pain, but the pain occurs because of painful sensations near the site of the missing limb, or even because of a non-painful touch on the cheek. The brain simply misinterprets the resulting neural activity. Most experiences of pain result when damage to the skin activates haptic receptors. The nerve fibers that convey pain information are thinner than those for temperature and for pressure, and are found in all body tissue that sense pain, skin, muscle membranes around both bones and joints, organs, and so on. Two kinds of nerve fibers have been identified for pain, fast fibers for sharp, immediate pain, and slow fibers for chronic, dull, steady pain. An important distinction between these fibers is the myelination or non-myelination of the axons, which travel from the pain receptors to the spinal cord. As discussed in Chapter 3, myelination speeds up neurocommunication. Myelinated axons like heavily insulated wires, can send information quickly. Non-myelinated axons send information more slowly. Think of a time when you touch the hot skillet. A sharp, fast, localized pain at the moment your skin touched the pan caused you to jerk your hand away. It was followed by a slow, dull, more diffuse burning pain. The fast-acting receptors are activated by strong physical pressure and temperature extremes, whereas the slow-acting receptors are activated by chemical changes in tissue when skin is damaged. In terms of adaptation, adaptation fast pain leads, to, leads us to recoil from harmful objects and therefore is protective, 
whereas Sloan pain keeps us from using the affected body parts and therefore helps in recuperation. Gate control theory. The brain regulates the experience of pain, sometimes producing it, sometimes suppressing it. Pain is a complex experience that depends on biological, psychological, and cultural factors. The psychologist Ronald Melzack conducted pioneering research in this area. For example, he demonstrated that psychological factors such as past experiences are extremely important in determining how much pain a person feels. With his collaborator, Patrick Wall, Melzack formulated the gate control theory of pain. According to this theory, we experience pain when pain receptors are activated and a neural gate in the spinal cord allows a signal through to the brain. These ideas were radical in that they conceptualized pain as a perceptual experience within the brain rather than simply a response to nerve stimulation. The theory states that pain signals are transmitted by small diameter nerve fibers. These fibers can be blocked at the spinal cord prevented from reaching the brain, by firing of larger sensory nerve fibers. Thus, sensory nerve fibers can close a gate and prevent or reduce the perception of pain. This is why scratching an itch is so satisfying, why rubbing an aching muscle helps reduce the ache, and why vigorous rubbing the skin where an injection is about to be given reduces the needle's sting. Figure 5.49 A number of cognitive states, such as distraction, can also close the gate. Athletes sometimes play through pain because of their intense focus in the game. Wounded soldiers sometimes continue to fight during combat, often failing to recognize a level of pain that would render them inactive at other times. An insect bite, insect bite bothers us more when we are trying to sleep and have few distractions than when we are wide awake and active. Conversely, some mental processes, such as worrying about or focusing on the painful stimulus, seem to open the pain gates wider. Research participants who are well-rested rate the same level of a painful stimulus as less painful than do participants who are fearful, anxious, or depressed. Likewise, positive moods help people cope with pain. In a systematic review of the literature, Swedish researchers found that listening to music was an extremely effective means of reducing post-operative pain, perhaps because it helps patients relax. The Charms and colleagues have pioneered techniques that offer hope for people who suffer from painful conditions. The researchers sought to teach people in pain, many of these people in chronic pain, to visualize their pain more positively. For example, participants were taught to think about a burning sensation as soothing, like the feeling of being in a sauna. As they tried to learn such, such techniques, they viewed fMRI images that showed which regions of the brain were active as they performed the task. Many participants learned techniques that altered their brain activity and reduced their pain. Of course, there are more traditional ways to control pain. Most of us have taken over-the-counter drugs, usually ibuprofen or acetaminophen, to reduce pain perception. If you've ever suffered from a severe toothache or needed surgery, you've probably experienced the benefits of pain medication. When a dentist administers Novocaine to sensory neurons in the mouth, pain messages are not transmitted to the brain, so the mouth feels numb. General anesthesia slows down the firing of neurons throughout the nervous system, and the patient becomes unresponsive to stimulation. You can use your knowledge of pain perception anytime you need to reduce your own pain or to help others in pain. Distraction is usually the easiest way to reduce pain. If you are preparing for a painful procedure or suffering after one, watching an entertaining movie can help, especially if it is funny enough to elevate your mood. Music may help you relax, making it easier to deal with pain. Rapid rubbing can benefit a stubbed toe, for example, or a finger that was caught in a closing drawer. You'll also feel less pain if you're arrested, not fearful, and not anxious. Finally, try to visualize your pain as something more pleasant. Of course, severe pain is a warning that something in the body is seriously wrong. If you experience severe pain, you should be treated by a medical professor, professional. And here's a chapter review, chapter summary.